Chapter 21 Okay, that can't be good, Gabe said when the walls stopped ringing from the echo of the slamming door. What makes you think that? Jeff asked in sarcastic fury. Everything in my life is always so almighty perfect. Why should my love life be any different? He walked over to the engine and snapped the latch on the door before climbing into the cab and throwing his turnout gear to the floor below. Why didn't you go after her? Because she's right, Gabe. She is. She doesn't need this. She doesn't need any of this. He slid out of the cab, jumped to the floor, and slammed the door. She doesn't need to be sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring, knowing the next time it does might be worse than the last time it did. She doesn't need that. She doesn't. But you need her. You don't think I know that? Jeff asked harshly, not at all caring who happened to walk in and hear. But it's killing me to see that look in her eyes. It's just one freak second away from catching up with us, and she knows it. What is? The work? The fire, Jeff said, straightening so that he stood toe-to-toe, -to -toe, staring at Gabe from point-blank range. In exasperation, he shook his head and stepped away. They don't give medals to the wives, you know that? For bravery in the face of a life they have no control over. They don't hand out medals and give speeches for that. He put his gear on the rack. No, but it's the wives who hold it all together at home. They're the ones who go to the funerals and the hospitals, hoping that next time it won't be them. And they're the ones left to take care of the family when something does happen. He worked with the coils of hose that wasn't cooperating, and then stood and slammed a hand against the side of the truck. Damn it! His hand went up to his face to stop the emotions from pouring out of him. I can't ask her to do that. I should never have thought I could. Jeff, this whole thing... With one yank, Jeff pulled the hose up from the floor. I'm going to wash this thing out. He walked over to the door to the wash tub, where he stopped and turned. Don't worry about me, okay? This might take a while. Slowly, Gabe nodded, and Jeff pushed the door open and stepped through it. Tears had never burned so fiercely. Lisa's eyes hurt from the relentless trek from her heart to her eyes and out onto her cheeks. The lights ahead of her on the freeway blurred as she reached up and swiped the newest batch away, but they were followed immediately by their replacements. How many had she already cried? Hundreds? Thousands? And yet there were that many more stacked up and waiting for a stray thought to hit her. She sniffed them back and gripped the steering wheel. Confusion reigned in her brain. No thought could stay with her for more than a few moments at a time, and too many of those thoughts centered on what she was driving away from, who she was driving away from. Like he might actually be standing there, she looked in her rearview mirror, and a ghost from what seemed like a lifetime ago stood there, hands in his pockets, watching her drive away. The tears washed over her like a gigantic wave bent on sweeping her right to the bottom. He had put too much soap in. The suds told him that, but he didn't really care. If he could have dove into them and disappeared forever, he would have. Everything he had told Gabe was true, except for one thing. He had made it sound far too easy to let her go. That was a rip, a cleave, that would never heal, and he knew it. It was a wound destined to bleed from this point until forever and beyond. And he, of all people, knew about the forever and beyond part. He'd been living it ever since that firefighter had set him on the ground under the night sky, kissed by fire and smoke, and had run back into that house. They said the bedrooms were too far gone at that point, the structure too unstable, that Bruce Malio should never have gone back in. And yet Jeff knew why he had. It was because of the pleadings of a 17-year-old kid who knew no better. Jeff wiped the edge of his cheek with one wet arm. The roof was weak. The fire had already eaten away the attic by that point. They knew that. He didn't. All he knew was that the two people he loved most were in the middle of those flames, and he pleaded for their lives. A memory ripped through him, 
a picture of him standing by his mother as the fireman handed a flag to Mrs. Melio, who crumpled over it like a can under a boot. He remembered the two little kids, too small to really understand, watching as their mother was led from the graveyard where their father now lay. That was the moment that Jeff had decided that this was his destiny. That was the moment, in fact, when he had shattered his own mother's heart into ever smaller pieces, although she wouldn't know it for nearly a decade. That was the moment that the course of his life was forever set. And now, in the face of that memory, he felt powerless to assimilate where duty to them stopped and love for Lisa started. Through the long nights after the accident, he had lain awake, thinking through all the things he could have done differently. Yes, he had felt more helpless and bitter in those hours than most feel in a lifetime. Yet not one moment of that could match how he felt when he looked into Lisa's frightened, pleading eyes now. He had to let her go, let her get on with her life. It seemed impossible. It felt impossible. But somehow, he had to find the strength to walk away. She deserved that much. This may be just a job to you, Lisa said Tuesday afternoon as she faced down Kurt and Joel, who stood before her desk like prisoners before a firing squad. But this is my life. I am not interested in half-done, shabby-looking, useless trash. Now, when you've got this office supply campaign ready for someone other than a two-year-old, I want to see it. Until then, she shooed them out with both hands. The weekend, extended for Labor Day, had been spent trying to dig out from under the piles of paper on her desk. True, it needed done, but that wasn't why she did it. Everyone else was going to picnics and parties and firework shows. Lisa had never gone to those when she had the inclination. Now, she definitely did not. All those things smacked of having fun. And that already loathsome concept was made worse by the fact that it now seemed to be a one-way ticket to thoughts of him. At all costs, she was avoiding thoughts of him. When they were gone, she sat back for one second and then pulled herself forward. She would not give in to the thoughts stalking her. Not now. Not ever. If Jeff could have kept his mind on the information the teacher was presenting in the hazmat class, it would have helped. Not that anything had helped since she'd walked out the door, but he could always hope. Once at home, he poured himself some water. Too tired and too frustrated with himself to make supper, he grabbed a bag of chips, sat down on the couch, and turned on the television. By now, he knew the routine. Either he would go to sleep on the couch sometime around 4.30, or eventually he would talk himself into going to bed and lay there until the sun came up telling himself the whole time to just go to sleep. He hoped it was a go-to-sleep-on-the-couch night. He hated the others. Just as he was settling in, the phone rang, and totally against all reason, he jumped up and rushed over to it, hoping it might be her. Hello? Mr. Taylor? Yes, he said as his heart fell. This is Zane's jewelry. Your ring is ready. Spiraling down, his heart plummeted. Why couldn't life just go away and leave him alone? Mr. Taylor? Um, yeah, I'm here. I'll try to get by and pick it up as soon as I can, he said, not meaning one word of it. It'll be ready when you are. As he hung up the phone, the word never drifted through his mind. Thoughts of Jeff were never far away from Lisa although she had made it a habit to camp out at her office instead of going home. Two days, she had actually gone without sleep. When she did go home, even turning on a light was dangerous, so she mostly left them off. The darkness was good company. It felt safe, like maybe she could hide there and life wouldn't notice she was missing. At work, her temper was getting shorter and shorter, so that all she had to do was walk into a room and people ducked for cover. There had been a time in her life when that would have felt like power, but now it just felt lonely. She had called Haley, 
who basically said, I told you so. And so, finally, by the end of September, she was right where she had always thought she wanted to be, dealing with everything on her own. The only problem was, she now hated every single moment of the life she had always thought she wanted. Taylor? Captain Hayes asked, walking into the truck maintenance room as Jeff stood replacing the tools he had used to change the oil. Yes, sir. I was under the impression that Lisa would be sending me the schedule for the conference thing any time now, but I haven't heard anything from her. She didn't take a trip to Bermuda or anything, did she? Jeff went back to his task. I wouldn't know, sir. Uh Uh-huh. Hayes nodded. And the fact that she won't return my calls? You wouldn't know anything about that either, now would you? No, sir. I haven't talked to her in a couple of weeks. Uh Uh-huh. Well, if you could get her a message for me, tell her that it's going to be hard for me to be there if I don't know when I'm supposed to be there. Jeff nodded. I'll try, sir. Hayes stood for a moment, grunted, and walked out just as Gabe walked in. Does the fact that we're in here working on the truck and they're out there playing basketball not seem at all fair? Jeff hadn't really thought about it. Working on the truck was something he could still lose himself in. And today, more than most days, he wanted to do just that. As of this evening, he would be one step closer to full-fledged firefighter. But there wasn't a part of him that really cared. So what did Hayes want? Gabe asked as he threw the rag he had just wiped the grease from his hands on to the table. However, the motion was a little too hard and it slipped off onto the floor. Instantly, Jeff leaned down and retrieved it. I don't know, some dumb thing about the conference. Gabe stopped and looked at Jeff. You still haven't talked to her? Jeff shrugged. I've been busy. Man, you can be so pig-headed when you want to be. You know that? Thank you very much. That wasn't a compliment. For a moment, Gabe rearranged the tools, and then he stopped. You know she probably feels the same way. What way? Like the rest of life isn't worth living if she can't be with you? I'm flattered. No, man, you're a guy who's trashing what could be the best thing in your life. And for what? A stupid job? You want me to quit? No. Jeff turned to the workbench. Well, she does. Do you? No. Yes. I don't know. I don't want to have to think about it anymore. Thinking about it is getting me nowhere. And not thinking about it is getting you, um, where? Jeff just glared at Gabe and slammed another tool onto the wall. Why don't you call her? Maybe talking will get you somewhere. It never has before, Jeff retorted. I don't see how it's going to help much now. Well, it's worth a shot. But Jeff knew better. Even if he could come up with the words, he could never say them for more reasons than he could name. The machine was blinking when Jeff got home the next morning, and he hit the button. Mr. Taylor, this is Zane's jewelry. Jeff closed his eyes, wishing life would just go away and leave him alone already. We still have your ring. Please remember after 30 days it becomes property of the store. Thank you. No, thank you, he said sarcastically as he punched the off button. Don't even start, Lisa said on October 1st as Tucker sat across the desk from her. I am doing the best I can here, and I only have two hands. What about the other six out there? He pointed to the door. Useless, she said with a shake of her head as she clicked across the screen on her computer and then down the schedule, which should have been printed a week ago. Every entry went right through her heart. The travel agency, that was Jeff's idea. He had sat right there in that chair. Ugh. She growled at the screen. You said we got 700 applications? So far, Tucker said, 
We're getting more into the office every day. Somehow I don't think they noticed the September 21st deadline. Apparently. Vera was trying to keep up with them, putting the kids in the sessions they asked for and stuff, but then this audit came up, and she got pulled off, and now... We've got 700 applications for 500 spots, no idea which came in first because someone forgot to put a registration date on the form, and two weeks to figure it all out. Basically, where are the applications now? Most of them are in my car. Most of them? Hey, I lugged two bags over here. I thought that was doing pretty good. Lisa exhaled slowly, feeling like the second coming might happen before she got to leave that office again. Fine, bring them up. Jeff was putting it off. He was putting everything off, life mostly. The ring, now lying on top of his dresser, wasn't helping. It stared at him like a judge set to pronounce sentence at any moment. Still, he couldn't put it away. He had tried, but even the darkness was sad without it lying there. So he had relented, and now it sat there, a permanent resident that was going nowhere. The clock on the wall read 10.30. It was too late to call her. She was probably asleep anyway. However, that afternoon, Hayes had asked and again Jeff had promised. Until then, he had always been a man of his word, always done what he said he'd do, no matter the cost to himself. But this cost seemed far too high a price to pay. Trying to find something to do other than sit and watch the clock all night, he stood and went to the bathroom. The stubble on his face blared how pitifully he was managing without her and although shaving at night seemed rather strange, he pulled out the razor anyway. There was no reason to look like the return of the wolfman, even though that's what he felt like. The phone in the kitchen rang, and the razor slipped. Ow! Crud! Bright red blood sprouted from the cut, and Jeff grabbed for tissue even as the phone rang again. He raced for it and grabbed it just before the answering machine did. Hello? You're there the female voice said in surprise, and Jeff's spirit lifted. Where else would I be? I figured you were working, she said, and his mind slipped across the fact that it wasn't Lisa. I was coming up with all these brilliant things to say to your answering machine. Eve. Yeah? He tried to push the disappointment down. Oh. What? she asked with concern. N nothing I just thought you were someone else. And this someone else wouldn't have light brown hair, nice legs, and wear a lot of dress suits, would she? The exhale was a little too loud. Did you need something? Oh, no, you don't. We were talking about you. Not a good subject. And Lisa? Worse subject. Oh, man, Jeff, what happened? Things were going so good. He sat down on the bar stool heavily and dabbed at the cut on his chin. Life, life happened, just like it always does. So what, you're taking a break? Yeah, a permanent one. Permanent? No seeing, no talking, not for the last month at least. And you're okay with that? Do I sound okay with that? No, you sound pathetic. Yeah, that's pretty close. Well, then why don't you call her? Because I wouldn't know what to say. And that's different how? Ha ha. I'm not laughing. He wasn't either. No, really, what were you calling for? She sighed. To check on some friends who I was really hoping could cheer me up. Oh boy, you called the wrong place for that. Yeah, I kind of figured that out. His brain enumerated the excuses of why he hadn't called Eve, even as his heart said there was no excuse. So, how are you doing? I've been better. You know, last weekend marked the eleventh week he's been gone. It seemed like a blink to Jeff, 
and yet he knew for her. What are you doing Sunday? Sunday? Not much, I guess. Church with my parents at nine. Football with my dad after. How about I pick you up at noon and we go do something? Like what? Your choice. I'm sick of looking at this place. Please, Eve, you'll be doing me a favor. What about Lisa? What about her? He asked, not seeing any connection. Are you going to call her? He dabbed at the drawing wound on his chin, but said nothing. I'll make you a deal, Eve said, teasingly serious. You call Lisa, and we'll go out on Sunday. But, and don't flake out on me either. I'm going to want details, lots of details. And I will ask, okay? She waited. Jeff? Yeah, okay. Great, then I'll see you Sunday. When he hung up with Eve, Jeff sat looking at the phone, knowing if he walked away from it now, it would be Sunday before he got up the nerve to try again. With an exasperated sigh, he reached for the receiver, dialed her number, and waited until the answering machine had gotten all the way finished speaking before he hung up. Somehow, he had forgotten how much he missed that voice. It wrapped around him like a warm, thick blanket on a cold, dreary night. He looked at the clock and wondered what she was still doing at work. It was after eleven already. She was at work, he knew that much. Work and home, that's my life. Words from a different lifetime floated through him, and he smiled sadly as they slid through his consciousness. Picking up the phone that time wasn't nearly as hard as it had been the first. In fact, if he was honest, an illogical excitement snapped him into its clutches as his fingers dialed. He felt like he had lost his mind, and yet he felt more sane than he had in a month. Envelopes sat in incoherent stacks all over her office as Lisa stood in the middle of them, shrinking before the hopelessness that stared her in the face. There was no way to make any sense of any of this. There couldn't have been thirty opened envelopes. The rest made her want to cry, so much so that when the phone rang at nearly 11.30, although she knew it was a wrong number, she jumped for it. Matheson Agency, Lisa speaking. A moment of pause, and she thought the caller might hang up rather than acknowledge their mistake. Lisa? Yes? Hi, the voice said, winding through her. It's Jeff. Suddenly, she couldn't breathe, and the room felt at least ten degrees warmer. Oh, Jeff. Hi. She started to sit down in the chair because her legs went numb beneath her but the two stacks of envelopes lying there sent her right back up again. Ow! Oh, no! Like a nightmare she could do nothing about, she watched one stack teeter, and then the letters slid one by one to the floor. No! No, 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 no! They kept falling anyway until only three out of the thirty were left in the chair. What are you doing? he asked with concern. Ugh! trying to do the impossible, she said in surrendered exasperation, and it's not working. Under the desk she crawled, gathering applications as she went. She stacked the ones she managed to round up back on the chair, and as she put her hand on the chair to pull herself up, she blew at the loose hair from her forehead in frustration. Her gaze slid around the room as she collapsed onto the carpet. Putting her back against the wall, she shook her head. This is hopeless. What? The youth conference. I've got all these envelopes, and I don't even know where to start, and I haven't gotten six hours of sleep in the last three days. Right now, I'm about this close to totally losing it. His side went silent for a moment. Would you like some help? That would be nice, she said, meaning from her employees and not together enough to realize what he really meant. It'll just take me a minute to throw something on, and I'll be there, he said in a rush of words. Be here? Wait, what? Oh, no, I didn't mean... Sit tight, I'll be there as soon as I can.
Lisa was sure Jeff hadn't meant the sit-tight comment literally, but that's all she could do. After she hung up, she leaned back against the wall and stared straight ahead. It must be her imagination or a hallucination. She couldn't have just said what she had. More than that, that couldn't have been his answer. Her hand went up to her hair, but it was too late to fix it. A shower? Makeup? A sand blaster? It would take at least that much to make her presentable again, but she had none of that, and he was on his way. Oh my gosh, Jeff said, when he pushed her door open and saw her sitting on the floor, the bomb blast around her clearly apparent. What in the world happened? Welcome to my nightmare, she said, as if she was tilting on the edge of sanity and he arched his eyebrows at the tone in her voice. What is all this? Slowly, he stepped over the piles of envelopes into the room and over to where she sat, one foot wrapped under the other, and he sat down on the floor next to her. This, she said, holding up an envelope, is the result of letting someone else do something for you. You see this? She thrust a handful of papers into his hands. See, no application date. None. Nice, huh? Really great. He took them from her and looked through them slowly. I've got 762 applications at last count and not a date on a single one of them. And the date's important? It's first come, first serve, and I've only got 500 seats. Like it was him who had made the mistake? She lunged for his throat, gripped it in her hands, and shook him hard. Then she let him go, smashed her palms against her forehead, and slid them down slowly. This is a disaster. I can see that, he said softly. His brain reeled through the problem, cartwheeling over solutions that had no hope of working. These didn't have the envelopes. Jan, Pat, Vera, somebody trashed them at Cordell Enterprises. Why? Because the envelopes should have a postmark on them, so you could conceivably... A moment, and her eyes widened in understanding. Oh, my gosh, you're right! She jumped to her feet and grabbed a stack of letters from the chair. One at a time, she picked through them. September 5th, September 17th, September 3rd. Oh, thank you, God. The chair caught her on the way down. Yeah, Jeff said, laying the stack of papers in his hand down beside him and picking up a small stack of envelopes next to him. Now all we have to do is sort through them, put them in order, open them up, and... She waved at him with both hands to get him to stop. One thing at a time. Quickly, she pulled something off of her desk, and then, as though it was the most natural thing in the world, she stood, marched back to his side, and sat down. Her fingers flicked the object up. Box? He smiled at her. I'd love one. About 3.30 a.m., Lisa yawned a small yawn, followed instantly by a larger one, and Jeff looked over at her even as she tried to squelch them. You look wiped, he said gently. Gee, I wouldn't know why, she retorted, picking up another stack to start sorting it as she leaned back onto the hardwood of the side of her desk. Her fingers went back to work, trying to get September 7th to follow September 4th. She was zoning out. She felt it. With a stretch, she tried to open her eyes wider, but that just brought on another yawn. Here. Jeff reached over to take the stack out of her hand. What, what are you doing? Without a response, he took hold of her arm and lifted her from the floor. You're not going to be good for anything if you don't get some shut-eye. But I can't. Not listening to the protest, he led her from the room. But there's... Through the dark office, they walked until they got to the conference room on the other side. She lowered her gaze skeptically at that room. What do you want me to sleep on? The table? I was thinking the carpet, but it's up to you, he said with half of that smile playing on his lips. I don't have time for this. And when you collapse from exhaustion tomorrow, are you going to have time for that? He worked the black shirt atop his white t-shirt off as he knelt on the floor next to the wall. 
Now, here, I know it's not the Hilton, but... When his hand touched hers to pull her down, life thudded to a stop. Come on, he said, his eyes gentle. Just a few minutes. Reluctantly, Lisa sat down and then flipped her hair over the shirt on the ground. Her cheek felt its warmth instantly, and all the fight in her vanished. Her eyes closed, and sleep swept over her. That's when she felt it. His hand, warm and soft, lying across her arm. Get some rest. Maybe just a few minutes, she said, already drifting away. But don't forget to wake me up. I won't. When her mind finally surrendered to the pull of sleep, her last thought was that he still hadn't moved from that spot, and she hoped he would just stay there right next to her forever. Jeff waited until her breathing slowed and found its own rhythm. In the darkness of the room, he was surprised he could see anything, and yet her beauty could pierce even the blackest of the black. He sat for a few more minutes and then pushed up from the floor, catching the edge of the table for balance. With one more look down, he stepped from the room and closed the door softly behind him. A look at his watch verified what he already knew. Quarter to four, and they still had a mountain to get through. Back in her office, he folded himself onto the carpet and smiled. She was crazy to think she could have tackled this on her own, and she was just crazy enough to have pulled it off, too. He picked up a stack and got back to work. It was the front office door that Lisa heard first. It jolted her from the marvelous dream she was having of them sitting in some field together, flying kites. Slowly, she yawned and stretched. That was when she remembered, and causing a head rush, she sat straight up and looked at her watch. It was almost eight. Why hadn't he awakened her? Jeff, Sherry said in surprise when she opened the door and found him, rather than Lisa, in the inner office. What are you doing here? Working, he said as his fingers threw the envelopes into the five stacks surrounding him, one for each week in September. Oh, Sherry said, and although it tried, her voice couldn't quite make it sound like that was the exact response she had expected. She looked out into the front office. Where's Lisa? Sleeping, Jeff said, flipping three more letters into one of the piles. Oh, Sherry nodded. Okay, she started out. Oh, Sherry, do you have any more of these boxes somewhere? He held one up. Maybe, her attention jerked outside the door as shock descended across her features. Lisa? Don't say it, he heard Lisa say and he smiled at the sound. One more small stack, and all they had to do was get the weeks in order. When she walked in, Jeff's heart said how much he had missed her over the last four hours. I'll get some coffee, Sherry said uncertainly, and she left. Sleep well? Jeff asked. Lisa sat down in a heap right next to him and dropped the shirt into his lap. You were supposed to wake me up. He smiled at her. It's that whole kissing a sleeping princess thing. I knew how much you hated that. I didn't say you had to kiss me. Her face scrunched together. There are other ways to wake a person up, you know. Then she really looked at her office and stopped. You're almost finished? Ten more, he said, flipping through the last stack in his hand. When the last of them hit the piles, he sighed and scooted back against a chair and wiped his hands over his eyes tiredly. Now all we have to do is get each week sorted. With a small yawn, he picked one stack up and righted the envelopes. These we don't have to worry about. They're all last week in September, so we can put them over here and use them only if we have to. That pile landed next to the wall. Coffee, Sherry said, walking into the room, and after she handed them each a cup, she pulled the box from under her arm. And here's your box. Thank you very much. Jeff set his coffee to the side and picked up another stack of envelopes. I say we start here, last week in August, and work our way forward. We, our, 
Lisa was waking up enough to catch on to those words, and her heart was suddenly asking why he was sitting in her office, not offering to help, but helping. You don't have work or something today? Nope, it's your lucky day. I'm off until Saturday morning. Thursday to Saturday? She ought to be good and insane in that amount of time. You really should go home and get some sleep. Lisa heard the phone ring in the outer office, but her mission at the moment was to get him out of hers. I'm sure you are exhausted. Lisa, Sherry said through the intercom, Zebra Carpet's on line one. With a tired shake of her head, she pulled herself up from the floor and grabbed the phone. Matheson Agency, Lisa speaking. Good, you're there, the voice on the other side said. Terry forgot to call you about our staff meeting today. Staff? We've got some concepts for promotions we want to bounce off of you. Her hand went to her hair, and she knew with one touch why Sherry had looked at her so strangely when she'd come out of the conference room. I really don't. She stopped and sighed. What time is the meeting? Without watching her, Jeff watched her. One person standing beneath a mountain of problems and trying to deal with all of them on her own. She had strength and determination in spades, but delegating had obviously gotten lost somewhere along the way. When she hung up, his gaze traced over to her. Problems? You could say that. I'm supposed to be at Zebra Carpets at ten o'clock. Her shoulders fell forward under the weight of life. But I can't leave now. Look at this place. Tell you what he said gently, holding her up with his gaze and voice as he stood and walked over to her chair. You go home, grab a shower, get you some non-wrinkled clothes, and then go to your meeting. We'll handle things here. But what about... We'll handle things. Carefully, he lifted her from the chair by one arm. Now go, and don't worry about us. Exhaustion was good for something, he thought, as he laid her purse over her shoulder and led her to the outer door before pushing her through it. At least she was too tired to argue coherently. Drive carefully. With only a small wave of acknowledgement, she walked away. When she closed the outer office door, Jeff looked at Sherry like they were on a secret mission together. How fast can you make a database? Ten minutes, depending on what's in it she said, lowering her voice. Fabulous. This is what we need. Why she was going to Zebra Carpets when it was obvious she should be working on the youth conference, Lisa couldn't clearly tell. She drove home and showered, which felt really good. Then she put on clean clothes, which felt even better, and wrapped her hair into a twist. When she was finished, she actually felt like living again which was a downright miracle. Grabbing her purse, she trekked to her door and back down to her car. The sooner she got this over, the sooner she got back to the office, the mere thought of which was sending the butterflies in her stomach swirling. Her arm still felt the heat from his hand lying there the night before, and her cheek still felt his shirt curled beneath her. Most of all, her heart still felt what it was like to be in his presence again, and no matter what rationalizations she tried to use on herself, none of them were working. Despite the space and time she had managed to put between them, he had never moved from his place in her heart, and she was beginning to get the sinking feeling that he never would. Every computer in every room of the Matheson Agency was manned by an employee diligently entering information into databases configured for the week he or she was working on. Every so often, Jeff would get out of Lisa's chair and go around to check on them. But that really wasn't necessary. They were all intent on getting this done quickly and accurately. When he sat back down in Lisa's chair after one such round, a quiet smile washed over him. Somehow, sitting here, he felt her presence. It was like sunshine on a dark soul, and it felt wonderful. The GTO sitting on the third level was hard to miss when Lisa pulled back in at 12.20. So, he was still here. Simultaneously, her mind said that was horrible, and her heart said it was fabulous. At the door to her office, 
She took a breath, wrenched the doorknob, and stepped resolutely inside. Sherry sat at her desk, and despite the audible snap of the door, she never looked up. I'm back, Lisa finally said, peering around the ultra-quiet office with concern. Everybody out for lunch? No, the guys are in the back. Jeff's working on your computer. Sherry took a bite of her sandwich without ever really looking up. My computer? On what? Database, Sherry said, setting one paper to the side and scrutinizing the information on her computer slowly. Lisa arched her eyebrows. Okay. Without another word, she walked to her office door and peered inside. Sherry was absolutely right. There sat Jeff, surrounded by the blue window at his back, looking very much like Sherry had, totally engrossed in what he was doing. Knock, knock. He looked up, and some part of her deep down said she liked that look in his eyes. Back already? It wasn't as bad as I thought, she said, swinging her purse into the chair opposite the desk and noticing that there were no longer envelopes stacked everywhere. Slowly, she followed her purse into the chair. What'd you do with the envelopes? Collating. Huh? she asked, wondering what rabbit hole she had fallen down. We're putting them all in this database Sherry came up with so we can collate them and put the kids in the workshops in the order they applied. Much easier than doing it on paper. Still, his attention seemed riveted to the screen. And Kurt and Joel? Third and fourth week, Jeff said. I've almost got this first week done, Sherry's on week two, and once that's done, all we have to do is put in the earlier ones and shuffle. She felt like she was shuffling, but not the items in a database. At that moment, Kurt appeared at the door. I got three done, he said. Then he stopped when he saw Lisa. Oh, hi. Hi, she said, turning to look at him doubtfully. Great. Jeff pulled the stack of non-enveloped papers out. Put these in a separate one and we'll be in business. Kurt took the papers and disappeared as Lisa looked after him in astonishment. How did you get him to do that? What? He got something done. Of course he got something done. That's the point, isn't it? Yes, it was the point. So why did she have so much trouble getting it accomplished? So can I help with this little project of yours? Instantly, he looked up. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to finish this? Not really. Her smile came, although she wasn't sure she wanted it to. How about if I finalize the workshop schedule so when you're ready to collate, it'll be ready too? Good plan. On wobbly legs, she stood and walked over beside him at the computer, taking the mouse from him. When he looked up, she was only inches away, and she felt his gaze. Just let me print out the stuff I have, and the computer's all yours. The edges of her skin melted under his gaze. He wanted to say something. She felt it, and yet he recalibrated his attention back to the computer. In seconds, the printer was working its magic. When it was finished, she took the sheaves back around to the other chair. Don't mind me, I'll just be over here, working. Chapter 22 Taking turns sleeping in the conference room, Jeff and Lisa worked all of Thursday and most of Friday. By seven o'clock, the schedule was finished. The applications were collated, the two lists had been merged, and Sherry had even verified everything with each speaker and every school. Alone, Lisa never could have accomplished it. And yet, with the army he had amassed for her, that and so much more seemed possible. So, Jeff said as Lisa put the finishing touches on the poster mock-up on her computer. So, Lisa said, immediately stifling the yawn that jumped to her throat. Her gaze didn't want to look at him in that chair, knowing the next time she looked, it would be empty. You want to go get some hot dogs or something? He asked, as if the fragile limb he was standing on might break. She looked over at him. With everything she had, she wanted to accept, 
And yet she knew that accepting would put her right back where she'd been the month before, talking herself into believing they had a chance. I'm beat. You're beat. You've got work in the morning. Her hand clicked to save the document. I really think we'd better call it a night. Not really looking at her, he nodded. She wanted to say something so he wouldn't look like he understood exactly what she was saying. Can I walk you to your car? He finally asked. Knowing she should say no, her heart took one look at him and smiled and said, Sure. Making each step last as long as he could, Jeff walked with her to the parking lot. There was nothing his arms wanted more than to reach over and take her in them, but he knew that wasn't what she wanted out of this night. It hurt, but he was willing to respect that, so long as she let him walk beside her and didn't tell him outright to get lost. Seeing no other option, he dug his hands into his pockets lest they betray his best intentions and reach out to her. I guess things are going well at work, Lisa said, bringing up the one topic he knew she didn't want to talk about. Yeah, pretty well. I start aircraft rescue on Monday. Her gaze jumped over to him. You're already through the hazmat thing? He looked at her in surprise and nodded. End of September. Oh, congratulations. One more rung up, huh? It felt like six rungs down. Yeah. Is the truck running again? Better, finally. I thought Gabe was going to blow a gasket before I finally figured out it was the fuel injector. He smiled. Never hurts to know a little about engines. They walked up behind the GTO. Well, she said, burying her gaze in the darkness at her feet. I guess this is good night. I guess. But he didn't move. His spirit had anchored his feet to the asphalt. When she looked at him, it was with unnervingly soft eyes. Thanks for everything. I would have been sunk without you. I'm always just a phone call away, he said gently, if you've ever got an office full of envelopes and no idea what to do with them. She smiled. I'll keep that in mind. He didn't know why, but standing there looking at her, Jeff couldn't help himself. Carefully, he bent forward, and with a touch on her arm, he kissed her cheek. Take care. Looking positively bewildered, she nodded, turned for her car, got in, and waited for him to shut the door. I'll see you. Yeah, he said, and sadly he pushed the door closed. His gaze couldn't even watch her drive away as he stood there helpless in the face of the end. Work the next day held no fascination for Lisa. She didn't want to work. In fact, she had sent everyone home saying they should have a Saturday off for a change. No, all she wanted to do was sit in that chair and feel him wrap around her. Over and over, her rational side said that she had been down that road already. It led only to heartache. And yet, she asked the walls, if that was true, then what was this hole in her heart that felt so painfully unfixable? It felt like an ache that could sweep her under at any unguarded moment. Everywhere she looked, he was there, not just in the office, but in her heart and her spirit as well. All she wanted was to spend one more minute with him, one more, and then one more, and then... Pulling her knees, clothed in denim, up into the chair with her, she spun the chair, and her gaze slipped to the rain falling outside her window. The first cold rain of the winter with spring so far away, it was merely a promise and nothing more. God, I don't know what to do here. It's like I can't live with him, but I can't live without him either. I was doing just fine, you know, before you sent him into my life. I was doing just fine. I was, well, not exactly happy, but... Her mind drifted back to those days. However, instead of the take charge can handle anything person she thought she'd find there, all she saw was a woman desperately trying to win the attention and affirmations of everyone around her and failing miserably.
In her mind's eye, she saw herself rushing to the next meeting, zapping anyone who got in her way, and criticizing herself over every little detail that wasn't perfectly in place. Only now did she feel the loneliness that followed that woman everywhere, and Lisa cringed away from her. One small tear slipped over her lash and down onto her cheek. Until him, life was one long string of forgettable moments. But with his entrance into her life, every moment had suddenly become one that she wanted no more than to hold onto forever. This is insane, she said, riding the chair, wiping her eyes, and standing up. There had to be something more productive than sitting around an empty office crying all day. Gabe had tried to ask about the situation three times already, and although Jeff was able to put him off, he wasn't nearly so successful with his own heart. He couldn't explain it, but being with her made him feel alive in a way he hadn't felt in many, many years. As the clock wound around to five, he thought about Eve. It would be nice to talk to someone, even if he already knew which side of the fence she would fall on. He laughed softly at that, a small gust, and he could as easily as not end up right beside her on that side. Nowhere, not one single place could Lisa go that he didn't follow her. Not to her apartment, not to the little cafe down the street, not even to the streets themselves. As she walked, the mere sight of the walk sign yanked up the loneliness. Driving, the thought of that clutch and all its inherent problems knifed through her heart. At the park, oblivious to the darkness and the rain, she got out and walked over to the tree as her heart flew with the memory of his kite into the sky. Leaning against the tree as the cold rain dripped around her, she closed her eyes, trying to breathe. The farther she ran, the closer he got and for the life of her, she couldn't figure out how to run any faster. I called you Thursday, Gabe said that evening as they sat at the tables long after everyone else had gone on stand down. Jeff didn't look up. His mind was too heavy to let him. I thought maybe we could hit the racquetball courts or something, but I guess you were busy. Slowly, Jeff nodded. You know, it might help to talk about it, Gabe finally said. I'm not Ashley, but I can do a mean imitation of her. Now, Jeff, this is what you should do. Frustrated, Jeff scratched his head. I wish somebody could tell me what to do. Well, what are your options? Homicide or suicide? Gabe's eyebrows shot up in concern. I try to make this work and end up killing her or I don't, and end up killing myself, Jeff clarified plaintively. Great choices, huh? Isn't there a middle ground? Jeff shook his head. Not that I see. He cracked his fist on the table. Ugh, if I could just get her out of my head. Do you really want to? Gabe asked. For a moment, Jeff thought about that question, and then lifted his gaze. No. I love him, Lisa said, two seconds after the door swung open to reveal Eve standing on the other side of the threshold in a bathrobe and pink slippers. Lisa, you're soaking wet. Forlorn and trembling, Lisa hadn't even noticed that fact. What am I going to do, Eve? Gently, Eve reached out and took hold of Lisa's arm to pull her into the apartment. First of all, we're going to get you dry so you don't catch pneumonia. Then, we're going to get you something warm to drink and have a little chat about making absurdly illogical choices. I thought I could do this, Lisa said later as she sat on Eve's couch, drinking the mocha-flavored coffee and pushing her still wet hair back with her fingers. I really did. I thought if I just kept going, kept working, kept moving, that I would forget about him. You're asking a lot from work. Eve said skeptically. Lisa raked her hand across her damp nose in frustration. Then he came the other night, and all my plans just blew up in my face. Now all I can think about is where he is and how he is, and 
how much I want to see him again. She took a small sip of the coffee, which did nothing to warm her frozen insides. I can't even think straight anymore. It feels like I'm going crazy. It feels like you're in love. Lisa shook her head and closed her eyes, laying her head backward on the couch back. I'm just so confused. About what? About everything. Where I want this to go, why I can't get him out of my head like I've done all the rest of them. I've never seen myself with someone like Jeff. Geez, I've never seen myself with anyone, much less someone like Jeff. I mean, he's sweet and kind and completely wonderful. Yeah, just the kind you want to throw back. But he won't talk to me, Lisa said in frustration. And then there's this whole fireman thing which makes me completely nuts. Eve nodded slowly, and Lisa's heart fell when she realized she shouldn't be laying this on the one person who understood all too well. I'm sorry, I shouldn't... No, Eve said softly, it's okay. She sighed and then looked at Lisa. When I first met Dustin and he told me he wanted to be a fireman, I thought, oh, cool, saving lives making a difference. Awesome. Later, of course, the fact that in order to save those lives he had to risk his own occurred to me. But by then, I loved him, and there was no going back. But how did you do it? How do you say, go ahead, put your life on the line every day, and I'll just sit back and hope it all works out for the best? Well, I did some of that too, but early on we made a pact to spend every moment we could together. That way, if something ever did happen, we would know we hadn't wasted time being angry with each other over the job. Eve exhaled. See, a lot of people live their lives taking for granted that they're going to have a tomorrow. Dustin and I never did that. We were thankful for every minute we had together. The words stopped for a moment. I have no regrets. But... He's gone. Aren't you angry about that? I get angry and sad and terrified, but mostly I'm just thankful that even if we didn't have forever on this earth together, we had the time we did. Because of Dustin, I know what love is. I have felt it. I've experienced it. I know the highs it can take you and the lows it can drop you but I have to tell you, if I had to do it all over again, even knowing what I know now, I'd do it all again in a heartbeat. Lisa shook her head slowly. I don't know if I can have that much faith. There are more things in this world than what we can see, Lisa. Like that night of the fire, I'd never been gone when he was on duty before. It was like an unspoken vigil I kept. Sitting here in the dark, waiting for that door to open the next morning. Then, my company wanted me to go to Dallas that weekend. I didn't want to go, not because of me, but because of Dustin. But he wouldn't hear of me staying here. I had to take the next step up. And if going to Dallas would help me do that, then that's what he wanted me to do. He took me to the airport, and right before I got on that plane... He took me in his arms, and he told me that he loved me forever. I can't explain it, but I think he knew. You never got to say goodbye, Lisa said with understanding. Softly, Eve smiled. We didn't have to. It was never goodbye with me and Dustin. It was always until I see you again. That was Dustin's idea because I had such a hard time when he'd leave at first. So we didn't say goodbye. We always said, until I see you again. And it's true, too. I know there'll be a time and a place somewhere down the line that fires don't happen and people don't die. And we'll be together again. Until then, I know his love is with me every day. In theory, it sounded so good. In reality, it sounded more difficult than anything Lisa had ever done. You have to learn to let go, Eve said. Life will take its course with or without you grabbing the wheel and trying to force it to be one way or the other. 
All that does is make your arms hurt. Let go and trust that whatever happens, it's for the best. That was for the best, Dustin dying? From my little perspective, it doesn't always feel that way, but I don't see the bigger picture either. I have to trust that in the bigger picture, it makes sense, that it was for the best. He was lucky to have you. We were lucky to have each other. A soft peace slid into Eve's eyes. Think about it, Lisa. You may not have tomorrow. Do you really want to spend the time you do have pushing Jeff away? In the middle of her heart, Lisa knew Eve was right. If he died tomorrow, what would she have gained by not being with him today? Would it make the cut of his loss hurt any less? When Eve smiled and said it was time for her to get some sleep, Lisa nodded, thanked her, and then curled under the blankets on the couch. No, she decided as the questions ran through her again. If he died tomorrow, she would regret every single second she had spent keeping them apart. Every single one. As a peace offering, and to say, I'm sorry for not being here for you like I promised, Jeff stopped off at a flower shop on the way to Eve's Sunday morning. She wasn't expecting him until noon, but the night at the station, minus his brain, had been quiet. He had gotten enough sleep. What he needed now was to talk to someone who could make his heart believe he was doing the right thing by staying away. It didn't feel like the right thing, no matter how many times he tried to explain to himself that it was what she wanted. At the apartment, he grabbed the yellow rose from the seat, ran his fingers through his hair, and took a breath. Seeing Eve, understanding the pain he was keeping Lisa from, would be exactly what he needed. That would be enough to make his decision solid. Of that, and only that, he was sure. On the doorsteps, he checked his watch as he reached over and rang the doorbell. 7.38. He dug a hand into the denim and brown suede jacket pocket and waited. No answer. Again, he reached over and hit the doorbell, listening this time to be sure it had rung on the other side. I'll get it. He heard the voice in the second before the door swung open. Wrinkled t-shirt, faded jeans, sleep still hanging around her, Lisa stood there, and his breath snagged. For six whole seconds, all he did was stare. Lisa? What? Her eyes widened in total shock. Jeff, what are you doing here? Slowly, her gaze slid down from his eyes, to his shoulders, to the rose in his hand. Awkwardness dropped over him. He tried to smile, but it fell halfway to his face. Um, I didn't know you were. He looked past her into the apartment. Is Eve here? At that moment, Eve strode out, hair up in a white towel, white bathrobe, and pink slippers. Who is it, Lise? Um, Lisa said as though she couldn't quite decide if it really was who she thought it was. It's me, Jeff said, carefully stepping into the room as scenarios of how and why Lisa was standing on that doorstep raced through him. Um, I thought if I came early. One thumb ran down the length of his nose. He glanced at Lisa, a move which took his heart to his shoes. I didn't know you were going to have company. Eve laughed. I didn't either. She turned and went into the little kitchen. I only got enough donuts for me. I didn't know I was going to have a party. She threw the little box onto the table. But you're welcome to them. There's milk in the fridge. I'm just going to go get ready. With that, she turned the corner to the stairs and disappeared up them. Ah, oh, man, I'm sorry, Jeff said, breathing the words more than saying them. If I would have known you were... No, no, Lisa shook her head quickly. It's me. I didn't tell Eve I was coming. I just showed up. He wished there was some sensible words to ask her why. Nice flower, she finally said, nodding at it. When he looked down, he hardly saw it. Oh, yeah, I brought it for Eve. I thought she probably hasn't had some in a while. He was having trouble breathing and swallowing and thinking. 
Lisa nodded. I can put it in some water for her, if you want. Slowly the rose came up, and he handed the stem over to her. He watched her take it, and he followed her past the little table into the kitchen. There he leaned on the counter and put his hands in his pockets. So you've been here all night? Since about one, Lisa said, and concern traced through him. Watching her was like watching his soul, and yet not being able to touch it. She was busy getting a vase and filling it with water. Eve didn't tell me you were coming. Yeah, he scratched the side of his ear. Well, I wasn't supposed to be here until noon, but she mentioned church, and, well, we had a good night at the station, so I thought maybe it would be a good idea to just come on over. How good of an idea that was, he couldn't really tell at the moment. Perfect, Lisa said, turning with the rose positioned flawlessly in the little vase. She set it on the table and sat down. Pulling her foot into the chair with her, she looked up at him. Absolutely, his brain said, looking at her. So, were you planning to stay all day? I don't know. I hadn't really planned anything, Lisa said. The waves of her hair drifted down around her face. You? For a while. I was going to take Eve out to eat or something, spend some time with her. Lisa nodded, then reached over and popped the donut box open. Want one? He shook his head. At the moment, his stomach was in too many knots to eat. I'm not really hungry. Silence descended between them as Lisa set the box back down. She didn't bother to take a donut either. So, how's work? He finally asked, fumbling for something to talk about. Good, she said softly, thanks to you. Her gaze swung over to him as she shook her head. I still don't know how you did it. Did what? Got my employees to be competent for a change. His face fell in confusion. I didn't do anything. Yes, you did. When it's me, they couldn't put one foot in front of the other without falling over themselves. With you, they're like, brilliant. I don't know how you do that. I trust them, he said gently. She seemed to coil back at that statement. I trust them. No, he said carefully. You expect them to make a mess of things, and so they do. Besides, they know it'll never be good enough for you, so they don't bother to do it right. But that's their job. It's not about the job. It's about trusting someone else to handle something. Her gaze dropped to the table. Trusting isn't really my strong suit. Doesn't mean that has to be true forever. Take Sherry. She came up with that database in about five minutes. Would you have let her do that for you? Or would you have done it yourself, figuring she couldn't do it right? There was no answer. See, Lisa... It's not a question of letting them do it poorly. It's a question of trusting them enough to make them want to do it right. Right now, you've set it up so they don't own their work. You do. It all comes back to you because if they screw up, they know you'll fix it. But it's my company. And you have every right to run it the way you want. But as long as you run yourself into the ground fixing their mistakes, they're going to let you. Lisa thought about that a long minute. Well, how do I not make everything mine? Little steps, Jeff said. The first time I walked on duty, do you think they put me in charge of a call? No way. They gave me one job to do. I did that job. I learned that job. And when they knew I could do that, then they started shifting me around to the other jobs. I'm not ready yet. But one day, I want to be the one running a call. It's not all or nothing. There can be steps along the way. Steps along the way. Three forward, four backward. That's what it felt like with them. But at least, this was better than avoiding each other at all costs. Don't tell me you don't like donuts, Eve said, turning the corner from the stairs, and Jeff's gaze snapped up to her. Fully dressed, hair done, and heels on, she looked the epitome of the fashion industry he knew she so loved. Dustin would have been in awe as always, and Jeff smiled at that thought. 
Jeff straightened with the knowing look Eve gave them. What time did you say church was? Nine. Eve pulled a sugary pastry out and took a bite. Well, if you're not going to eat them. Slowly Lisa stood, and Jeff wasn't sure that he liked the sadness in the hunch of her shoulders. I'd better get going. He nearly moved to stop her, but at the last possible second, he held the protest back. Oh, you don't have to, Eve said, nearly choking on the donut piece in her mouth. You could go with us. However, Lisa shook her head. I've got some work I've got to get done. On Sunday? Eve asked in horror. Yeah, Lisa said, and Jeff's heart fell at the thought that they wouldn't get to spend the day together. Lisa went into the living room and gathered her things. Thanks for everything, Eve. Sure, girl. Leaving the donut on the table, Eve went to Lisa and put an arm over her shoulder. Any time. Eve's gaze lowered. Think about what I said, okay? In slow inches, Lisa nodded and then backed away. The fight to keep the tears and emotion at bay was obvious. So was her intention to get as far away from him as fast as she could. I'll see you later. Drive carefully, Jeff called after her as she stepped out the door. His heart splintered the words across the pane in the final look she gave him. Who could focus on anything? Lisa asked as she drove back through the streets now kissed by the golden sun of autumn. Driving, breathing, living, it all felt so hard. Everything had felt so incredibly hard since that phone call. Yes, that phone call had changed everything for her. Yet what had it really changed between them? The illusion that she was in control? Her fingers gripped the wheel, white-knuckled. Facing that realization pulled her ego to its knees. Yes, it was true. Until that moment, she had believed she had the power to guide where she was going in life. Since that moment, she had been rudderless, adrift in an angry sea that was bent on pulling her down into its depths. But I don't know how to let go, she pleaded. I don't know how, God. However, God was apparently busy because there was no answer. In frustration, she reached down and flipped on the radio. He doesn't call you to understand everything in every moment, the preacher on the radio said, with that same lilt that all preachers on Sunday have. Frustrated, Lisa reached for the button. When Peter stepped out of that boat, do you really think Christ required that he understand how it was happening? How he was able to walk on water? Lisa's hand slipped back to the steering wheel as her heart tripped over the words. No. All Christ said was come, all Peter heard was come, and he did. As long as Peter kept his eyes forward on the God who loved him infinitely and would never allow the winds and the waves of doubt to overcome him, as long as Peter did that, those waves had no power over him. It was only when Peter stopped looking at our Lord, it was only when he looked down at the waves, and only when he saw the wind. It was only when he stopped trusting Christ and started trusting his own understanding and his own power that he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Of course, you know the story. Jesus stretched out his hand. He took hold of Peter, and what did he say? O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? That's where the story stops. And we chide Peter. Why did you doubt? Christ was right there. He would have kept you above the waves if you would have just... Just what? Not tried to handle the situation on your own? But don't we all do that? Don't we all look around and freak out because the wind and the waves are too much for us to handle alone? Of course they are but they have no power if we keep our eyes on the Christ standing before us. And in every moment, Christ is always before us. He is already there where you fear to go. He is already there, and he has made it safe for you to pass.
But instead of looking at him, instead of trusting him, we look around and we see the wind and the waves pulling at us. They throw us off balance and threaten to drown us. It's when we think we have to handle all those things on our own that we begin to sink in doubt and fear, and we cry out, Lord, save me, just like Peter did. But the truth is the same for you as it was for Peter. All you have to do is keep your eyes on the Christ before you, the Christ who loves you infinitely and would never allow the winds and the waves of doubt to overcome you. When you do that, the waves, the winds, they have no power so long as you keep your eyes on him and his plan for your life. So then, the question is, when he says, come, what is your response? Do you instantly look at the wind and waves and say, no way? How can I? Are you crazy? Or do you step out of that boat and walk toward him with confidence, knowing he will take care of everything else? Lisa's chest felt as if the air had been going in, stacking on top of itself until there wasn't room for any more. What had Jeff said about small steps, about trusting? What had Eve said about letting go? In different words, they were all saying the same thing. She, the perennial ice queen who could handle everything on her own, was kidding herself that she was going anywhere on her own power. No, she was stuck, right where she had been all those long years before when she had vowed that unlike her mother, she would never fall into the trap of needing someone so much she couldn't let go and then have them let her down anyway. That vow, so sensible at the time, had cost her time. It had cost her being close to anyone, letting anyone get close to her. And it had nearly cost her a life with the man she loved. Of course, one decision didn't banish all the other doubts, but if she kept her gaze on God's plan for her life instead of on the waves and the wind around her, his power could become hers, and together... Okay, God, I'm ready. Show me the first small step, she prayed, and for the first time in a forever of prayers, she felt like someone had actually heard. You're awful quiet. Eve said as she and Jeff sat by the big bay windows of the restaurant. Then she smiled. Not that you're ever very loud. The words running through Jeff's head pulled thoughtfulness to his face. I was just thinking about what the guy said in the sermon today. You know, about how if Friday had been the end, then the cross would be a symbol of tragedy instead of the symbol of hope. His fingers went up and drifted across the metal cross at his chest. We always wanted to be Sunday, don't we? We don't want to go through the Fridays of life, but the resurrection of Sunday would mean nothing without the tragedy of Friday. I don't think I'd ever thought about it like that either, Eve said softly. I kind of feel like I'm at Saturday now, waiting, not knowing what's coming next. Sometimes I think what's coming will be Sunday, and sometimes I'm afraid it's going to be another Friday. Jeff nodded. I've been at Saturday so long. I'm not sure I'd even recognize Sunday anymore. He held up the cross. Mom gave me this. At the academy, Eve said, and Jeff nodded. I take it she wasn't thrilled about the fire department thing. No, she didn't understand. She thought I had a death wish. He shrugged. Maybe I did. What does she think now? He breathed in the question. I don't know. I haven't seen her since she left that day. I thought it'd be easier for her if I stayed away. Eve twirled her fork on her plate, although she didn't seem to see the food there. How would that be easier? Jeff wasn't eating much either. Food had lost its allure. That way she wouldn't have to think about me every day and remember everything she's lost. Your dad and Kit? Slowly he nodded. She blamed me for it. No, she didn't. It would have been nice to believe that, but he knew better. Yeah, she did. 
But even if she hadn't, she should have. I killed the two people she loved most in this world. I did, and she never forgave me for that. He sat back and closed his eyes against the pain that admission brought up. If I'd just put those dumb rags away like she told me to, why was that so hard? But no, I had to throw them on the bench like a spoiled little brat. Kit could go to the party, I couldn't. It seemed like such a big deal at the time. Now, there was only softness in Eve's eyes. You were a kid. Anger slashed over him. Yeah, a kid who should have known better. A kid who did know better. Oily rags and a water heater flame don't mix. I knew that, but that wasn't what I was thinking about. Not to even mention that propane tank Dad had told me to move six times already. Jeff sighed softly. But I was too busy as usual with my own life. Too busy to worry about little details like that. And then, Mom was left with me. The one who didn't have the funny stories to tell. The one who couldn't tell a joke to save his life. The one who was a terribly poor substitute for her favorite. Jeff. It's true. He stopped her protests with one look. It is. Do you know she didn't get to tell them she loved them? She didn't. She told me that one night, that all she wanted was to hear them say it and to be able to tell them one more time that she loved them. I took that away from her, and because of my stupidity, she'll never have that chance again. And what about you? His eyebrows furrowed. What about me? You're still here. Why doesn't she tell you she loves you? He didn't answer. He couldn't. Jeff? She'd never bothered to before. Why would she strain herself now? But I never quite fit into her plans, Jeff said, his gaze settling on his fork with the admission. She was supposed to go back to work after Kit, international finance. That was her dream. She was on the fast track to being the vice president of her company. Then she got pregnant with me, and her whole life changed. I guess she had a lot of trouble because she was in bed for like the last three months of it. When I finally got here, I was a pretty sick little kid. If it made you sick, I caught it. We were in the hospital more than we were home. Daycare was out, so finally her work had to find someone else. Eventually, I grew out of that, but her career was shot by that time. I can always remember Dad trying to make me not notice how she felt about me. He'd take me out to do things, fly kites, fix cars, but I knew. It wasn't hard to notice. On Saturday mornings, I'd hear them in the kitchen all laughing and talking, and I'd know that the second I stepped through the door, the fun would be over. His gaze never lifted from the table. Then I burned the house down, and as bad as it was before that, Things were worse after. She'd scream at me for every little thing. If supper wasn't ready on time, or if I left my car too close to the fire hydrant, or a hundred thousand other things. I tried, but... He exhaled. I went to business school. I thought that would make her happy. Dad always said he wanted his sons to graduate from college. Kit never got that chance, so I went, even though I didn't really want to. That day I stood on that stage, I looked out across that whole auditorium of thousands of people, and there wasn't one face out there I knew. Not a single one. He laughed softly. She still wouldn't know about what I'm doing now if it wasn't for Dustin. The letter. Jeff nodded. I think he wrote more of it than I did. I never would have had the guts to put it all on paper. Honestly, I figured she'd trash it the second she got it anyway. His thumb traced over the cross. She told me to tell them not to call her if something ever happened, because she couldn't handle another funeral. Then she gave me this, told me good luck, and left. I haven't seen her since. You know she thinks about you every day. I doubt it. And every day she wishes she had done things differently and that she could have another chance. Yeah, right, and you know this how? Eve looked at him, 
because I know how it feels to push away just when you need to be there the most. In the darkened apartment, as the lights from below traced across his ceiling, Jeff lay watching them. One day their time on this earth would come to an end. There was no sure bet in the world. She would leave him, or he would leave her. But regardless of the circumstances, the opportunity to say those words would forever be gone. How many times had he wished that Dad or Kit could come back for one moment and give her what she so desperately wanted? Yet his own heart wrapped around those words like a dog hoarding food. True, she had never said them to him, but he hadn't said them to her either. If the opportunity evaporated before his eyes, would it be her he blamed for that, or? His gaze slipped over to the clock. It was late, and yet how much later was it getting with every tick of that clock? Would he have tomorrow if he didn't take the chance tonight? Pushing the idea ahead of him, he swung his legs out of the bed and dragged them through the hallway to the phone on the counter. It was one phone call, and yet it was so much more. A slow button at a time, he dialed the number and waited through the rings. When it clicked, his heart clicked with it. Hello? Time froze around that voice. Mom? He fell through the word, his heart plummeting ahead of him. Um, it's Jeff. Jeff, what's wrong? He heard the concern flood through her voice. Nothing, he said softly. I just wanted to call and tell you that I love you. The words rang on the wires between them, followed by a long moment of utter silence. You, oh, well, I love you too, she said slowly, with surprise lacing the words. Where are you? at home. Another long moment of silence. Are you still with the department? Yeah, I still am. Oh. His brain fought for something to say. Are you still liquidating estates? She said slowly. It keeps me busy. He wound an elbow up to the countertop. How are you? Good. I'm going on a trip to San Marcos with some friends next week. Oh, yeah? That sounds like fun. Yeah, it does. The wires buzzed loudly between them. For a long moment, he waited, thinking, hoping that she would ask about him. But finally, she said, Well, I'm sure you've got other things to be doing. I'd better let you go. Yeah. The word hurt, I guess. Take care of yourself, okay? I will he said, willing strength into his voice. You too. When he hung up, the center of him ripped in two and he laid his forehead on the corner of the wall. She could do that, just hang up and go on with her life. She could, but somehow he couldn't. He needed someone he could love, someone who could love him in return. He needed that, and of every single person on the face of the earth, There was only one person who fit that description. Closing his eyes, he picked up the phone and dialed the number. He had to swallow the protests in his head. Strength was in the asking. Courage was holding out a hand and trusting that she would take it. Faith was believing that Sunday would follow Saturday, as Saturday had followed Friday. If only you held on to the hope long enough. The phone clicked. Hello? Lisa? Hi, it's Jeff. I need to see you. Chapter 23 What is up? Lisa asked in barely concealed panic when she opened her door at nearly midnight to find him looking like he was about ready to jump out of his skin at any moment. I'm sorry, I know it's late, but this couldn't wait. Jeff ran a frustrated hand through his hair. Slowly, she opened the door wider. Come on in. He stepped past her, and she felt the pent-up energy flowing off of him. When she closed the door and turned to him, he hadn't moved as far as she had thought. He was standing there, two feet from her, 
and if ever she had felt out of control, this was it. So what's the emergency? The concern in her narrowed her gaze like a laser. With one look at her, his body shook slightly. This isn't right. Quickly, his hand grabbed hers. Here, sit down. Uncertainly, she let him lead her to the couch where she sat, but still he didn't calm down. Instead, he paced back and forth in front of her. She watched him, back and forth, back and forth. Whatever it is, you can say it. I'm a big girl. I can handle it. Well, me and God, her heart said, and she smiled. But his pacing continued. Look, Jeff, it's okay, really. One of her hands caught his as he passed, and he looked down at her. She tried to get peace into her eyes. It's okay, really. Whatever it is, you can tell me. A moment, a nod, and slowly his body slid onto the couch next to hers, although the jitters didn't leave. It took him a long moment even then to say anything. Finally, he let out a long breath. I've known how I felt about you for a long time now, but I've had a hard time putting it into words. Yeah, she said as worry for him brushed her heart, and she kept her gaze trained only on him. When he looked at her and smiled, some of his nervousness slid away. Before I met you, I didn't have much luck with girls. They didn't understand me. I didn't understand them. At least, that was my excuse. The truth was, I knew that sooner or later I would do something to ruin everything that got started. So, I just didn't start. I stayed in my little hole and hoped no one would notice me. It was easier that way. Then you came along, and all of a sudden, that little hole wasn't nearly as comfortable as it had been before. I can't explain it, but for the first time, I felt safe with you. Like I mattered, too. You do matter. He put a finger up to stop her. Shh, I need to say this. She nodded wordlessly, and his finger dropped away. There are 17 million reasons why I should have just walked away from this thing right from the beginning, but I couldn't. I couldn't because you make it safe for me to live, to be myself, even when I don't think myself is all that great. I like who I am when I'm with you, but I think that I haven't been honest with you about who that is. Her gaze searched his profile as he let go of her hand and took a breath. He closed his eyes to get the words out. I didn't become a fireman to help or to save lives. I became one because I was trying to make up for something I did. His voice faded out and her spirit fell with concern. He looked right at her then, and nothing in her could look away. When I was 17, I got careless with some rags I was using on my car. My mom told me to put them away, and at the time, I was mad at her. So, I threw them on my workbench and left. The words slowed. I heard the box drop. I can still hear that thud in my head but I didn't go back to pick them up. I was mad, and I thought I had every right to be, so I left them there and walked out. Mom had a meeting that night. She had just left, and Dad and Kit were working on some computer program Kit had brought home from college. I went to my room and slammed the door, planning to mope there all night. All the words stopped as he sat squeezing the pain from his eyes and trying to breathe. Finally, he sucked in a ragged breath and forced himself to continue. It all happened so fast. There was this unbelievable explosion. I didn't even know what it was at the time, but it knocked me off my bed. When I hit the floor, all I could think was that whatever had happened was bad. By the time I got to my door, there was fire and smoke everywhere. I couldn't see anything. It was just all smoke and flames but I knew where Dad and Kit were working. It was in the direction that all the flames were coming from, so... Lisa knew him, and she knew what was coming, although he didn't speak the words immediately. The nightmare hung there between them, so close she could feel the heat and the terror of that 17-year-old boy, knowing his family was in danger, 
and yet helpless to get them out. Unshed tears clung to him. He beat them back. I went as far as I could into it, but the smoke was just so thick, and the fire was everywhere. He shook his head. Finally, I got down on my hands and knees and started crawling, yelling their names, listening for them so that maybe I could find them. I don't know how long I crawled like that. It could have been minutes. It could have been hours. I heard something once, and I tried to get to it, but when I got to where I thought it was, there was nothing there. At least, I couldn't see anything. All I remember is knowing that if I didn't get to them, no one else would. He exhaled slowly. The next thing I remember is the fireman dragging me out onto the lawn. I looked up, and I remember how bright the stars were. Then I remembered why I was out there and who was still in the house. I begged the guy to go back in and find them. That's all I could think. Get them out. Please, just get them out. The words stopped for a long moment, and then he shook his head. He shouldn't have gone back in. It was too dangerous. I know that now. He shouldn't have gone back in, but he did, because I asked him to. Softly, Lisa put a hand on Jeff's knee, which he obviously didn't feel, as he fought through the memories surrounding him. Still, she wanted to let him know she was right there for him, whether he realized it or not. I remember watching the roof cave in, he said, as if he was seeing the scene before him now. That whole section just collapsed into this huge ball of flames. Hayes took over his voice. He had just gone in, just had time to get right in the middle of that thing when it fell. I sat there on the grass, and I knew he wouldn't make it out. They wouldn't make it out. And it was all my fault. He was a fireman. He knew the risks, Lisa said, trying to make it better, but knowing all too well the other side of the fireman's story. And he wanted to help because I'd asked him to. Jeff's head fell forward. Just like Dustin. That name shattered across her heart. Oh, Jeff, that wasn't your fault. That night, I yelled at Dustin for help, Jeff said, only hollowness in his voice. There were these three people I found trapped, and I thought we could get them out. I couldn't do it alone, so I called for help, and Dustin came. If it hadn't been for me, he would be at home with Eve right now. Oh no, Jeff, that's not true. It was an accident. I heard the ceiling fall, he said, the words broken and splintered. The tears began to fall for real then. I heard it, and I should have gone back right then. If I had, maybe. Seriousness drilled into her. No, now you listen to me. You had no control over that ceiling. You had no control over where he would be when it fell. It was an accident. Just like the rags, Jeff asked, and bitterness seared the question. They were an accident too, right? An accident that never would have happened if it hadn't been for me. Gently, Lisa slid over to him and pulled him into her arms. His head dropped onto her shoulder. Okay. Now, you listen to me, Jeff Taylor. There are things in this life that we can't control, things that make no sense while we're here. But you can't blame yourself for them, and you can't spend your life trying to right the past by torturing yourself now. Helping people is who you are. It's you, not who you're trying to be, not who you want to be. It's you, and I love you for that. But putting these obligations to help on yourself because it's going to change the past doesn't work. It won't. It can't. His head moved side to side. I just wish I could get them back. Love for him slid through her. Of course you do, because you care. I wish I didn't. Life would be a whole lot easier. No, she said softly. 
Pushing people away because they might hurt you doesn't make things easier. It just makes you lonely and miserable. Believe me, I've found that one out the hard way. He exhaled, sat up, and put his elbows on his knees. Then he dropped his face into his hands. I'm so tired of hurting. I'm so tired of waking up every morning thinking that maybe today I'll do something to make it go away and climbing into bed every night knowing it's all still the same. Lisa laid her hand on his back. You're still punishing yourself, torturing yourself for something you had no control over. You're still holding on to fear and pain that's keeping you stuck right where you were when that fireman put you on the grass. But pain and fear don't move you forward, Jeff. They're holding you in that moment. But it happened. I don't know how to get it out of my head, how to make the memories stop. Have you ever tried forgiving yourself? His head shook slowly. Look around at all the hurt I've caused. How can I forgive myself? People hate me because of the things I've done. No, they don't. They don't hate you. But even if they did, does anyone hate you more than you hate yourself? Lisa watched him, knowing the answer to that question. It's not easy, but after you've taken responsibility, there comes a point that you have to step out of the boat and let go. He looked at her in confusion. Huh? She laughed. It's something I heard on the radio. Life's not easy for anybody. The wind and the waves are right there all the time, waiting to knock you over. But the point is, you have to step out of the boat anyway. You have to trust God enough to believe that he sees the bigger picture and would never let the wind and the waves get the better of you. Jeff laughed softly and then sighed. That sounds great, but I don't know how to do that. Small steps, she said with a smile, just like you told me. You have to take small steps. Take the first step, then he'll show you the next one. Neither of them moved for a long moment. So the question is, what's your first step? When he looked back up, his gaze caught hers and she could see the confusion and the interminable ache in the depths of them. Could you hold me? He finally asked softly. If that was the first step, the others should be the easiest of her life. Her arms slipped over his shoulders. As long as you need me to. Delegating. It was a word Lisa had heard only in the context of reading the dictionary definition. On Monday morning, however, as she sat at her desk staring at the stacks of work in front of her, she thought about him. Small steps. If he was willing to take a few, then what excuse did she have? She picked up a stack of folders laden with information and walked into Sherry's office. These have been on my desk for six months now, Lisa said, and I don't think I've even looked at them. Would you do something with them? Sherry looked up blankly. What? File them, trash them, whatever needs to be done with them. Okay, the stack landed in Sherry's hands. And I've got six more stacks just like that one, so when you're finished with it, you can come get some more. Perplexed, Sherry nodded, and Lisa went back to her office, now to give Joel his assignment. The classes, the information, somehow they all felt different today. Small steps. That's what Jeff was taking today by coming to class, not to somehow change what had already happened, but to move forward with his life, a life that he now chose because he wanted to, not because he felt he had to. As the lecture continued, Jeff thought about Lisa, and the truth was he couldn't imagine moving forward without her. However, although she hadn't run the night before, he still had no idea if her stance toward their chances of being together had changed. His pen slipped across the paper unguided. He needed to find that out. He needed to know if they were destined to be forever friends or if she would step out of the boat with him and ask for more. And the only way to find out 
was to ask. Knock, knock, Jeff said at 5.30 as he stood outside her office door, wrapping it with his knuckle. However, when he opened it, he wasn't at all sure he was even in the right office. Her desk was clean. He could see the wood it was made of. There were no files, no folders threatening to slide off, only her computer and a few pieces of paper lying there, and life shifted at his feet. What, are you checking up on me? Lisa asked from behind him. Jeff spun around to see her. Her smile was lit by the glow in her eyes. Stunned, he took the sight of her in. I thought I must have the wrong office. It looks that way, doesn't it? she asked teasingly. She stepped past him, through her door, and around her desk. Where did all the files go? he asked as he followed her in and sat in the chair. She shrugged. Ask Sherry. Sherry? he asked uncertainly. And you're all right with that? Hey, I have a place to put my mouse now. She picked up the gray object and laid it down. I'd say that's a good first step, wouldn't you? Sounds like it. So, how about you? How was class today? Good. We went over the different kinds of seating in an airplane, he said, as he folded his hands in front of him. I never knew there were so many. Buy seats, tri seats, seven across, planes with both, different configurations and combinations, and you're supposed to know what each of them have just by knowing what kind of plane it is. Why? she asked, as if she really cared. For one second, he hesitated, knowing the road that question led down. Because if one crashes, you have to know where the passengers are, so you know what's worth going into and what's not. Her gaze fell from his face. So that's what this class is about? Crashes? He nodded. By next week, we'll be out on the runway doing drills, running scenarios. It was clear she was working through what he was telling her. What about work? I'm on Wednesday and the rest of this week. Isn't that going to be tough, going to school and working? It's not so bad. I did it last month and it was okay. But then... He pulled himself up with his elbow and looked over at her, hearing the words but not getting them all the way to his mouth. She looked up at him, puzzled. Then, what? He leaned his head to the side. Well... I've got this other project I'm working on this month, and it's going to be taking up some time, too. Oh, yeah? What's that? She asked, as if she genuinely had no idea. You, he said softly, gazing right at her, and her gaze swept over him. He looked at her, and the words he had been saying for a month, but only in his head, tumbled out. Look, I know what you said that night at the fire station, on the steps and I know why you said it. I know this isn't what you expected, and I know I don't have a choice but to give you one. But I still have to ask if you think we can find a way to make this work, us, work. Or are you going to give up no matter what I think? For the longest moment of his life, she said nothing. Finally, she looked at him. Well, what do you think? He laughed softly. What do I think? Well, I know what I know, and what I know is that as hard as I've tried to make myself believe differently, I love you, Lisa. I have ever since the first minute I saw you. I've done everything I can to tell myself it's not going to work, that you don't need me like I need you, that you'd be better off without me. But the truth is, I want this to work more than anything I've ever wanted in my life. I want you in my life, and I want to be in yours. That's what I know. She sat in silence, just blinking at him. Say something, he finally said, hoping his heart could take her next words. I don't know what to say, she finally said. I thought I did. I thought I would. But now that I'm here, I don't. Well, what do you want to say? breath slid from her. I want to say, Jeff, you're the most wonderful person I've ever been with, and I'll do whatever it takes to make this work. His heart slid through his chest. But...
She was still looking at him even as she shook her head. But how can I be sure love is enough? I mean, I want to believe it is. I want to. But I'm not sure I can. Why not? Because I know reality now. I have seen it, and it scares me to death. It scares me that I can't just say, I don't want this, and walk away from you. It scares me that every time I see you, I have a hard time holding on to the reality that there might not be a next time. It scares me that I could be right, that if I don't take this risk, I'll regret it forever. But it also scares me that I could be wrong when I feel like nothing can touch what I feel for you. What if it can? What if I trust this and it's gone tomorrow? What if you don't and it's gone tomorrow? He asked. Will that make it any better? She closed her eyes and he saw her struggle. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm so confused. My mind's all jumbled up and I don't even know where to start sorting it out. Slowly he stood, stepped around the desk to her chair, and sat on his heels in front of her. For the first time in a forever of hours, he felt completely at peace. Even if she didn't trust their love, he now did, and he knew it was enough. His fingers brushed over the hair at her temple, and her eyes opened. Her gaze searched into the depths of his heart. I'm not asking for now, he said as he gazed into the fear in her eyes. I'm asking for when you're ready. Lisa, I want you with me. I do. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And you need to know that if I have to wait forever for you to be ready, I will, because I have no other choice. You are the one I am meant to be with, and there will never be anyone else. So, when you're ready, I have a ring for your finger, and a pillow for your head, and a heart to hold yours forever. When you're ready, they're all waiting right here for you. Just say the word, and they're yours. As she sank into his arms, peace had never felt so real. She was with him already, whether she knew that or accepted it or not. They were together, tied by an indestructible bond. There was no reason to deny it any longer. And the more Jeff trusted that, the more peace flooded his soul until all of life opened around him. He kissed the side of her hair. I love you, Lisa, and I always will. Being in his arms, it was the surest way to lose touch with all the rationalizations Lisa was clinging to for fear she would inextricably fall through the point of no return. Sure, Eve had said pushing him away would only lead to regrets, and she knew that was true. But still, something in her said losing him wouldn't kill her if she just held on to the belief that he wasn't her life, that she wasn't his, that together they weren't better than they were alone, that without him, her life could go on. Although all her scrambled brainwaves were telling her this made no sense, her arms wouldn't let him go. They clung there, holding him, clutching to him. She didn't want to let go, but if she admitted that, fear surged through her. She was destined to lose. If she loved him and lost him, she lost. If she didn't love him and he walked away, she lost. Everywhere she looked was loss and heartache. Take your time, he said as the tears overtook her. It's not now or never. It's now and forever. But all she could think was, if only it were so easy. That night, as Lisa lay in bed, rolling until the blankets were in knots around her, she reached the point of the cracking of her sanity. Ugh, why is this so hard? I thought love was supposed to be easy. You're making it hard because you won't trust a voice from the darkness said. I know, I know. Step out of the boat. But how can I do that? The boat is safe. Out there isn't. Don't let it fool you, Lisa. The boat's in the waves, too. In her mind, she looked around. 
the voice was right. The little boat she was so furiously clinging to was being smashed at on all sides by the winds and the waves. But I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to trust like that. Let go. Just let go and believe I'll be enough to hold you up. Her body hurt. Searing pain screeched through her as she held on, fighting to right her world on her own. Until you trust, love is just an illusion. Love can't live where there's no trust. But what if I fall? If the possibility of falling were not there, trust would not be necessary. If you could do it all on your own, love would not be necessary. If trust and love were not necessary, there would be no need for other people or for me. But those things are not true, and you know they aren't. They are manufactured beliefs that you thought would keep you safe. But they won't. You know that now. So let go of them. I'm trying. No, trying is not doing. Doing is doing. Let them go, Lisa. You can't hold on to them and be free. It doesn't work that way. Squeezing her eyes closed against the shards of pain slashing through her, her own words drifted back to her. Torturing yourself by holding on to fear and pain is keeping you stuck right where you are. And where she was, was in a sinking boat, clinging to beliefs that were holding her back from really living. Slowly, her stifling grip eased from the fear that she had held so close to her heart for so long. It was the fear that said people would always let her down, that she could trust no one, that alone was better than being hurt. But as she let go, she realized that alone hurt too, that fear wasn't keeping her from getting hurt, it was keeping her in the hurt, permanently. The handhold on the boat slipped from her grasp, and after one small drop down, she was floating, sustained by a power that was not her own. On her own, she had struggled and fought to make life safe for herself, never really feeling the safety she so desperately sought. On the wings of this power, however, she was safe. She could feel it even now. It wasn't a mere feeling. It was a part of her, simple as that. And Jeff? she asked, knowing the answer would be there. What does your heart say? Her spirit laughed. There was no question about that. Lisa called him the next morning, the moment the sun broke through her window, but he was already gone for work. She called him at the station when she got to work, but they were out training. That was all right, she thought, as she laid the phone in the cradle. Some things are meant to be said in person anyway. All day she thought about him, and all day her thoughts were not those of fearing for his safety, but of knowing that he was with her, no matter what. So, when the clock wound around to after five, she gathered her things and drove home to get ready. It wasn't a date, but it felt like the biggest one of her life. With her hair down and the soft pastel blue dress swirling at her ankles, Lisa took one more look in the mirror. Accepting at a fire station wasn't exactly her idea of romantic, and yet, in a strange way, it made more sense than accepting anywhere else. As she drove through the streets, she remembered the day she had run away from this life, but it wasn't with the guilt she had thought she would feel. To be where she was now, out walking on the waves, it was necessary to have been in that boat first. Without trust, there is no love, and without risk, love would mean nothing. Without the wind and the waves, walking like that would not be the miracle she now felt it to be. She checked her watch when she got out at the fire station, 7.22, stand down time. With a snap, she opened the station door and stepped into it. However, in the next breath, she realized the station was empty. No trucks, no people. 
Hello? She called, but no one answered. Her gaze dropped to the waves at her feet, and for one moment the fear returned. No, she told herself firmly. Jeff's worth trusting, and so is God. Resolutely, she looked back up. That's when she heard the door open down the hallway. Her feet carried her forward. Hello? Is somebody there? Yeah, the voice said from the depths of the hallway. When he broke into the station, Dante smiled broadly. Well, if it isn't Lisa, how are you doing? Good. She reached up and wrapped her hair over her ear. Where are the guys? Call out on Balan Street, a residential. I've been listening to the radio. It must be pretty bad. It's taken a couple of houses out already. Determined to keep her newfound faith with her, Lisa kept her gaze up off the waves as she nodded. Is everyone okay? Dante shrugged. Far as I know, but they don't usually broadcast injuries over the scanner. Oh, she said as her heart begged her to go see Jeff. Where did you say that was again? Bayland, but I'm sure it's all blocked off by now. You won't get within a couple of blocks of there. Yeah, she nodded. That's okay. I was just wondering. She smiled at him. Well, take care. You too. Quickly, Lisa strode out into the late October air that now seemed cooler than it had before. Her hands wrapped around her bare arms. It was a fire like all the rest of them. Bad, kind of bad, really bad. Did it really matter? They all held tragic possibilities for the men called to fight them. In her car, she tried to tell herself to go home. Dante was right. She couldn't get within a couple blocks anyway. Yet her heart said Jeff was there, and he didn't know what she now did. Driving through the streets slowly, Lisa thought about him as she stopped at a red light. In front of her car, people streamed into the street, dutifully obeying the walk sign, oblivious to the fact that it was now flashing, Don't Walk. They hadn't even noticed. She hadn't noticed. But he had. Jeff the man who had turned her whole world upside down and then rearranged it into a pattern she would never have thought possible. You know I'm not supposed to go, she told the empty car around her as her fingernail tapped out a fast beat on the steering wheel. You know that, right? Yep, just like I know you're going anyway, came the reply from her heart, and she smiled as she turned the corner. Three houses had been lost. The charred shell of the middle one was hardly recognizable in the fading light. The other two could be rebuilt, but the middle one would never again stand as it had before that day. It was ashes now, lost forever. Jeff wondered about the people who had lived there. How would their lives change because of that one moment in time? He sent up a prayer for all those whose lives that single moment would touch. All those now, and all those in the future, who couldn't even see this moment as it passed into the night. As he pulled the once white cotton hose, now grimy black, from the rubble, he wondered if anyone had prayed for him that night, so long ago. They must have, for it wasn't without a whole lot of help that he had gotten to this point. He thought about that kid who had sat alone on that lawn late into the nights that followed the fire. And in his heart, he wrapped an arm around him and told him that although Friday seemed all around him, there was a Sunday in his future. All was not lost, as it had seemed to be in that moment. All was never lost, if you were willing to hold on until Sunday. The pavement at Lisa's feet seemed as inconsequential as air. It flowed by her strides in great lengths of black blue, hardly noticed but for the slap of her strapped sandals on it. Fear had nothing to do with it, only a desire to see him so overwhelming that nothing could stand in her way. At the scene boundary, she slipped around a bush and passed the edge of the perimeter as if it wasn't even there. Across the carefully manicured lawns, still green despite the season and the growing darkness falling on them, she ran. Her spirit flew before her, pulling her forward until she felt like she was soaring. When she finally broke through to the trucks, 
it took only one glance at the fireman standing on the asphalt, feeding hose up onto the truck, to know beyond a doubt that everything he had said was true. He was with her always, and she only had to trust enough to recognize that. Jeff, she said as she stepped from the curb. When he looked over to her, it was a mix of surprise and concern that flashed through his eyes. Lisa? He stepped over the hose as she flew the last three steps into his arms. Holding her, the strength in his arms flowed into her spirit as the world around them dropped away. All she wanted to do was hold him, to let him know that at every step from here on out, she would be right there at his side. She asked no more from life. No one gets a guarantee, her heart said, and despite the hard shell of his fire suit, she pulled him closer to her as a stream of tears slid down her face. You have this moment and only this moment. What you do with it is your choice. As those thoughts poured through her, she pulled back from him and ran her hands over his grime-covered, soot-stained face, and no face had ever held so much promise. I'm so sorry, she said as she gazed right into his eyes. I wasted so much time. No, he said, smiling softly. You're here now. That's all that matters. I love you, she said, the emotions choking out the words. And more than anything in the world, I want to be the one you spend your life with. Confusion and then slow understanding slipped over his features. Does that mean? Yes, she said, nodding until her head could have tumbled right off her shoulders for the motion. It means yes. His eyes closed in disbelief at the words, and in the next breath, she was once again in his arms, jumping through the point of no return like it was a simple mirage. A moment or a hundred thousand, whatever God gave them, she would stand right at Jeff Taylor's side. Then, in the moment when God called one of them home, she would look back with no regrets, for she would have spent all the time from that moment to this loving with complete trust. And that was the only measure of love that ever truly mattered. This has been To Protect and Serve, Volume 1 of the Courage series. Written by Stacy Stallings, narrated by Becky Dowdy. Copyright 2012 by Stacy Stallings. Production copyright 2014 by Stacy Stallings. This has been a Braveheart Audiobooks production. What's coming next? Find out, like, and subscribe to the Stacy Stallings YouTube channel and never miss a second of the story. Epilogue Kids milled about all across the hard concrete floor of the Civic Center, the second annual Cordell Enterprises Youth Leadership Conference, with 750 kids in attendance, had been a resounding success, even better than the first one the year before, and that understanding brought a smile to Lisa's heart. A whole year had come and gone since they had stood on that street and held each other, yet it seemed a lifetime. Lisa's hand slid across the top of her growing stomach as she drifted away from Mr. Cordell, who was already talking about who they should contact for speaking at the conference the next year. She slipped over to the little group gathered at the side of the stage and took her place by Jeff's side. It was a given. If he was in the room, that's where she wanted to be. As close as one body could get to another, spirit to spirit, they were one and in four months, they would be three. Her heart filled at the thought. Well, you did it again, Lisa, Dante said as she lifted Jeff's arm and slid under it. It had been far easier to talk the station into sending its three top firefighters in place of a solo captain this year. Dante, now a trainer, Gabe, the station's newest lieutenant, 
and Jeff, the latest firefighter to be promoted to driver. She couldn't imagine life without them. Yeah, thanks to you guys and a mountain of great help, she said with a smile. I could never have pulled this off by myself. Modesty, Eve said with a nod to Jeff from where she stood two steps up on the small set leading to the stage. I knew there was a reason you hooked up with her. Yeah, he agreed as his gaze found Lisa's, not to mention the fact that she's beautiful and strong and brilliant and... His lips found the edges of the skin at her neck, and she laughed in embarrassment. Would you behave yourself, she asked as her hand pushed him back. I don't know, he said, pulling back to look into her eyes seriously. That's a pretty tall order with you around. And you said he was shy, Lisa said to Eve. Hey, I'm not taking any responsibility for that one, Eve said with a raise of her perfectly manicured hands. He was when I met him. And that was before or after his brain transplant, Dante asked from his position at Eve's side. Before, Eve said, nodding. Definitely before. Um, excuse me, a voice said from behind Lisa, and when they turned, Jeff's hold on her shoulders broke free. The young face, so familiar and yet indistinguishable from the hundreds of others Jeff had seen that weekend, gazed at him, expectant and yet hesitant. Can we help you? Lisa asked as the wheels of Jeff's head struggled to put that face with a time and a place. Yes. The gaze behind the dark glasses fell. Well, kind of. Um, I just wanted to come and say thanks. The kid held out his hand to Jeff. I never got a chance to that day on the bridge. A breath and all the pieces fell into place. Parker? The young man nodded as Jeff shook his hand. I couldn't believe it when I saw you up there today. I've been trying to find you for a year now to say thanks, but I guess there are a lot of firefighters in Houston. A few, Jeff said with a smile. Then he noticed the close presence of a friend at his elbow, and he turned to look at the man who looked much older now than when he had first run up on the bridge that day. Hey, Parker, you remember AJ, don't you? He was the paramedic that day. Yeah, Parker said as he realized who the man standing next to Jeff was. No hat and looking decades instead of a simple year older, AJ held out a hand. Sorry, I didn't recognize you. That's okay, AJ said with a soft smile. I'm just glad you made it. The two shook hands. So, you came to the youth conference? Parker nodded. They said the emergency teams would be talking, and since that's what I'm wanting to go into when I get out next year, I thought it'd be a good idea to come check it out. Go into? Jeff asked, tilting his head to the side curiously. Parker's gaze fell to the floor. Well, I haven't exactly decided yet. Fire, police, rescue, something like that. The edge of Lisa's hand touched Jeff's arm, and he knew her thoughts without her speaking them. That's great, Parker, Jeff said sincerely. It really is, but do it for you, okay? It's too tough to do it for someone else. A question, and then understanding slid through Parker's eyes as he smiled at Jeff. I'll remember that. Hey, Parker, someone called from the auditorium edge. Parker's gaze jerked to the side, and he turned back to them hurriedly. My ride's leaving. I'd better go. Jeff pointed to the program in Parker's hand. Any time you've got questions about the field, give me a call. If I can't answer it, I'll find someone who can. I appreciate that, Parker said, holding out his hand again. And thanks for everything. When Jeff shook the hand, he once again felt the potential in its warmth. You're more than welcome, Jeff said with a nod. Parker turned back for his group, and Jeff had to take a breath of thanks himself. A life pulled back, one of the ones that made the job a calling to be heeded rather than a nightmare to evade. A life, a single life, and suddenly it all seemed worth it. So, what do you say? Anybody up for some dinner? 
Gabe asked, still standing on the stage steps next to Dante and Eve. Who's paying? Jeff asked, raising an eyebrow. You are, of course, Dante said teasingly, and he wrapped an arm over Eve's shoulder and smirked at her. Don't you think the ones who talked us into this thing should pay? Cool, Eve said laughing. Dinner's on Jeff and Lisa. Lisa looked at Jeff with teasing concern. I hope you brought your wallet. I hope you brought your dish gloves, he said. Typical man, Eve said, shaking her head. They conveniently forget their wallets every single time. It's okay, Lisa said as she ducked under the arm Jeff held out. I didn't marry him for his money. Good thing, Dante said. Jeff turned and smiled at her. Yeah, good thing. Her eyes beamed at him with a promise of forever. At that moment, his vow in life shifted from a promise to protect and serve others to a new pledge. For as long as he lived, he would protect and serve the woman who had stood by him in the midst of life's greatest turmoil. Not because he owed her, but just because his love would let him do nothing less. As the others started out in front of them, Jeff held Lisa back gently. His grasp around her shoulders tightened. Hey, you did good today. Softly, she looked up at him, belief in all their future held, shining in her eyes. No, we did good. You're right, he said, pulling her to him, heart, body, and soul. We did good. This has been To Protect and Serve, Volume 1 of the Courage series. Written by Stacy Stallings, narrated by Becky Dowdy. Copyright 2012 by Stacy Stallings. Production copyright 2014 by Stacy Stallings. This has been a Braveheart Audiobooks production. What's coming next? Find out. Like and subscribe to the Stacy Stallings YouTube channel and never miss a second of the story. It was at that moment that he first heard the noise on the stairs. Oh no, the soft voice murmured. No, 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 no. Oh, help. With no thought to the decision, A.J. dropped the box from his shoulder to the floor and ran for the stairs. There, midway up, behind three unstable and sliding boxes, stood a figure half on one step, half on the next, fighting to keep control of the boxes lest they cascade right over the railing but losing the battle badly. Here, A.J. descended the steps quickly and reached out for the top two boxes just before they had the chance to slide off into the abyss below. He didn't bother to ask. The soft plea was enough to tell him that his help was both needed and wanted. When the two boxes slipped from their precarious base into his hands, A.J. smiled at the face they revealed. Long, slender nose, almond-shaped eyes, small, squared forehead under a mass of near-black hair that was secured to the top of her head, but falling down all around her face at the same time. A moment passed, and then recognition hit him like a punch. Eve? A. J.? she asked, and her face dropped in shock. What are you doing here? The smile came easily. Waiting for you, I guess. When her face fell in confusion, he laughed trying to drop off a box of stuff for my dumb sister, who doesn't seem to be home. He jerked his head back to Chelsea's door. But I thought the other sounded better. The sadness and fear etched in her eyes dissipated. Huh. Well, I'm glad. For a minute there, I thought my stuff was a goner. He looked over the side of the railing dubiously. Yeah, three flights down airborne? That might not have been a real good idea. Gently, he shook the boxes in his hands especially if there's something breakable in here. Hey, careful with that, she said, jumping. See, not such a good idea to just toss it over the side. His smile slid onto his face as he made the slight motion of throwing the boxes overboard. So where are these going anyway? End of the hall, right, Eve said, nodding in that direction. But you can just set them at the top. I can get them. A.J. pursed his lips together. 
Seems to me it's only right, since I rescued them from certain destruction, that I carry them the rest of the way. She put her head down as if she might actually decline his offer. Okay, she finally said softly. He swung the boxes up the steps in front of him. Lead the way. Carefully, she stepped past him, and it wasn't until they were midway to her door that A.J.'s senses picked up on why she looked so different today. In gray warm-ups under a mud-brown cable-knit sweater that draped over her like a tent, she looked like a starving college student more than a fashion mogul. At her door, Eve fumbled with her keys for a moment and then released the lock and stepped inside. The space beyond resembled Chelsea's digs, except it had an airier feel to it. Two huge windows spanned the wall to the right where the dining room was, or would be. Save for the three boxes they carried, the whole place was empty. Nice, A.J. said as he walked to the windows and looked out without bothering to put the boxes down. Not much of a view, but I thought it would be good light for my drawing table, Eve said from behind him as she set her box on the floor. Then she straightened and watched him for a second. He turned, and the vulnerability evident in her stance and features touched his heart. It's great. Then he remembered the boxes. Carefully, he lifted them as if to ask where to put them, and she jumped to life. Oh, you can put those anywhere. Kitchen, living room, dining room. It doesn't matter. Nodding, he stepped by her into the living room. At one end stood a stone fireplace with bookshelves on either side of it. Just over there is fine, Eve said, waving at the expanse of room. He slid the boxes onto the fireplace hearth and turned to her. You just getting started? One slender hand traced its way up her neck tensely. Trying to. The movers are supposed to bring the big stuff on Monday, but I wanted to move some of the little things myself. Oh. Until that moment, it hadn't sunk in that she was the one moving, and suddenly he didn't know where to go from there. So do you have more downstairs, or what? Some, she hedged, but I'm sure I can get it. Offhandedly, he shrugged. What's a white knight for if they can't help carry a few boxes? You don't want to miss what comes next. Like and subscribe to the Stacy Stallings YouTube channel so you never miss a second of the story.